Prof will start now. So, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, our first speaker uh, for this series of webinars is Dr. Edward E. Hershaf from UNLV School of Medicine. And uh, his lecture is about forensic dentistry introduction. And uh, on behalf of Dean King Khalid University College of Dentistry in Abbas, Saudi Arabia, I welcome you all uh, to this webinar. And I'm sure uh, it will be a very successful one and a very informative one. Uh, Prof. Edward, please start your uh, lecture. Well, thank you for that introduction and uh, welcome all around the world and particularly in Saudi Arabia. Uh, I'm going to present uh, an introductory component of what forensic dentistry is, at least from the perspective of the United States. And uh, uh, with the limitation of the time, uh, I'm not going to be able to go into uh, human abuse. That's for another forensic uh, presentation. And I'm not going to talk much about bite marks. This is just about um, the use of forensic dentistry to identify uh, human individuals. So I'm going to, since it is an introduction, I'm going to try and make it as uh, simple as possible, but as Einstein said, not too simple. One of the ways that uh, a society is judged, particularly uh, by Sir William Gladstone in the 19th century, uh, was how a community or how a country cares for its dead. And uh, you will see that it's very important that uh, we come into this life with an identification, and it's important uh, for our relatives, our families, and in cer certain situations from a legal standpoint, uh, the processing of an, a will in a state requires that uh, human remains be identified. So the outline, uh, certainly going to define what forensic dentistry or forensic odontology, the international word for dentistry is. Uh, talk a little bit about pattern recognition and then get into human identification, the methods we use. Uh, again, a, a total concept. I'm not going to be able to get into the human abuse in this particular uh, conference. So please be advised that uh, this is a very uh, graphic topic, as you might expect. Uh, the material is being presented for educational purposes. And I always extend my deepest condolences to the families of those who've been lost uh, in these cases that I'm going to present. They will not be forgotten. The material for this comes from my own cases and the American Board of Forensic Odontology uh, collection of cases from the diplomates of that uh, certifi certifying uh, agency. Uh, lots of abbreviations. Uh, the CCOCME is the Clark County Office of the Coroner Medical Examiner. And Clark County is where I'm located in Las Vegas, Nevada. And then the OCME of New York City, the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner of New York City. Lots of uh, scary looking slides. Even if you look away, you will still get an A in the course. So the source of uh, Two modern usages of the word forensic. Uh, it's a form of legal evidence, a category of public presentation speaking in front of individuals. And the term forensics is also now used in place of forensic science. Uh, it's kind of a generic term. And of course, the legal and public presentation aspects of this comes from the Roman Forum. Uh, when you present it in the 
forum in Rome 2,000 years ago, uh, the derivation of forensic comes from that. So the definition of forensic dentistry, certainly that area of dentistry concerned with how you manage, examine, evaluate, and present dental evidence in criminal or civil proceedings, uh, obviously in the interest of justice. Many of my colleagues who are forensic dentists are also attorneys. They have uh, attained a JD degree, a Juris Doctor degree. Uh, but you have to have some knowledge of how to uh, handle yourself in uh, a court as an expert witness, hopefully not as a defendant. Forensic dentistry uh, is part of oral and maxillofacial pathology, that subspecialty of dentistry. And it's uh, very similar to what our colleagues in medicine do who specialize in pathology. And then in pathology for the physicians, you can either do surgical pathology, anatomic pathology, and then by extension, forensic pathology. And medical examiners are trained as forensic pathologists. This is a, um, an overview of the number of dentists and the last numbers I found were 2015. Approximately 200,000 dentists in the United States. And you can see at the bottom of the slide, uh, there are currently 98 forensic dentists who are board certified by the American Board of Forensic Odontology. This uh, board was created in 1976 and over time, there will have been at least 150 dentists certified by the board with uh, retirement, attrition, and uh, unfortunately death. Uh, we now have about these, just under 100 forensic dentists in the United States. Do you have to be a forensic dentist in order to work in this field? And the answer to that is no. So here's a forensic dentist and a police officer. The police officer doesn't look too happy at this point, but the forensic dentist is looking at a set of radiographs and uh, a little bit of hyperbole of what we can do as forensic dentists. He states to the police officer that they're looking for a male Caucasian and can tell all of this demographic information about the individual including the fact that he has a dog named Ruffy and drives a green and white Chevrolet with expired license plates. This makes the policeman very happy. Well, I wish we could do all that from looking at one set of radiographs. Another way to define forensic dentistry is obviously describing the tasks that we do. I'm going to concentrate today on human identification, both individual and what we used to call uh, mass disasters. But obviously in a mass disaster, not everybody dies. And uh, we now call this multiple fatality incidents or MFIs. The aging of uh, individuals by teeth and bones, particularly with the very fluid population movements caused by disasters, wars, things like that. Uh, it's important to age individuals so that we um, know whether certainly uh, of legal age or not. And bite mark analysis. Bite mark analysis is very controversial today because uh, DNA uh, has supplanted the uh, use of bite marks as evidence in many cases, and bite mark evidence probably represents about, in my 40 plus year forensic career, uh, maybe 5% of all the cases I've done. Unfortunately, it represents about 95% of what is uh, described to the public uh, relative to these 
very controversial cases. And for a future presentation, human abuse recognition, and we now call it human abuse. It's a child, intimate partners, elderly, and abuse of the disabled. This is another term that's changed, intimate partner violence. It's not just a spouse. Uh, an intimate partner is someone at a dormitory at college who's sharing a room. It can be individuals in same-sex relationships or heterosexual relationships. So there's a broad category, uh, and this overview uh, for intimate partner violence uh, often called in the past spousal abuse, but it's actually beyond that today. And eventually, if you're getting involved in the forensic field, field uh, you're probably going to have to go to court for some cases to describe uh, the opinion that you have based on the evidence that you've looked at relative to bite pattern analysis, dental identification, abuse, etc. And these can be either civil or criminal cases. Most dentists are not involved in forensics, I would advise to stay out of court. We work in our nice clean offices and um, hopefully nothing very controversial. And regardless of the uh, country that you're from, uh, the court is based on an adversarial situation, which is not what we or physicians or other healthcare professionals are used to. So try and stay out of court unless you're there as an expert trying to uh, arrive at a decision for justice based on an identification, bite mark analysis, etc. So let's begin the journey. Now, because of the nature of many of the images, uh, I, when I present this type of a lecture, I always have my topic separators with nice touchy-feely things like kittens and puppies. So let's look a little bit about pattern recognition. The uh, comments that you read was an actual case that was reported by the Associated Press in a newspaper in Indianapolis. Um, I got a pretty hard head, and it wouldn't take me 32 hammer blows to commit suicide. So obviously the investigators got it wrong, and this was a homicide. If you look at the picture at the top, the circles, a lot of times we misinterpret patterns, and this can be very uh, uh, controversial in forensics, certainly. And uh, my background is as an oral pathologist, and you want to make sure that your diagnosis is correct and not misinterpret. Uh, of those observing, how many think that the spirals are one giant spiral, or are the spirals actually separate circles? And the answer to that question rhetorically is uh, there are separate circles, but our eye kind of trained to think of that at first glance as one spiral getting narrower and narrower. Again, how many individuals think this is an old witch woman? If you think that this is the eye, but it can also be a young woman. If this is the face, there's the nose, and this is the ear, and this is kind of a necklace around her neck. So interpreting patterns correctly is very important in diagnosis and certainly in forensics. Thinking outside of the oral box, if you saw a patient who came in with this type of pattern on their lower lip, obviously not a professional tattoo, I instruct my students that uh, something like this could be very important for identification. 
but also uh, when you are examining this patient, I would be very concerned about sexually transmitted diseases, hepatitis B and C, and uh, perhaps even HIV. This is not a professional tattoo that was placed in a uh, tattoo parlor where uh, sterile instruments are required. And I will show you in a little bit the individual who put this tattoo in this young lady's lower lip. Now here's a pattern. This is an autopsy that uh, has been completed and the probes are placed in the leg and they only really make sense as a pattern if the leg is lifted so that they are now all parallel. So this was an individual who was shot by a shotgun and this becomes probative and could be used in court, it's not an inflammatory picture, because um, the, the defendant perhaps, and this is hypothetical, may, the defendant's attorney may say, uh, this gentleman was strangling my client and he shot him. Well, obviously, if this is a shotgun pattern, uh, the pellet holes that are shown by the probes indicate that this man could not have been next to the individual. Uh, he was further away based on the pattern, and he was in a running position. So let's look at some of the types of cases and the patterns that we get involved with in forensic dentistry. Uh, most of the time, uh, we are not asked to examine an individual who's uh, identifiable and not burned, decomposed, etc. Uh, you may know through the international news that we had an incident here in Las Vegas where a, a gentleman fired into a crowd of people leaving a concert and 58 people were killed. Uh, this was a couple of months ago here. Um, the forensic dentists on our team were not called into that case for identification because everyone had identifiable jewelry, wallets, pocketbooks, and no one was decomposed. So uh, most of those individuals were identified by personal recognition. So here we have an individual recently uh, deceased and you can see that they are starting to uh, be very dry. Uh, the tongue has expanded some. And now a partially decomposed individual. These are the kind of cases that you may be involved with if you get involved in forensic dentistry. And dentists are very uh, uh, aware of nice smells from the dental office and we are uh, like things very neat. This is often a problem for some of the folks to try and get involved in forensic dentistry because the tactile sense of feeling the cold human remains, the smells, the visual uh, uh, senses uh, are all kind of attacked when you go into a morgue and look at these types of cases. Mutilation. This is an airplane accident on the right. Uh, this gentleman and his two sons were uh, flying in a, a business uh, plane that they, their company owned and it crashed. And this is what people look like when they fall out of the sky. Um, a case like this, the forensic dentist would be called in. And in a case like this, before the body or the remains that you see are taken out of the body bag, a portable x-ray unit is brought in and the body bag is serially radiographed so that we can identify where bits and pieces and remains of the maxilla and mandible may be to facilitate the identification. This is analogous to what a um, uh, ballistics expert would do in the case that I just showed you with the gunshot wounds to the legs, looking for the pellets for analysis. That's me 
on my motorcycle. Uh, notice I do not have a helmet on. Some states in the United States require that in order to ride a motorcycle, you have to have a helmet. Uh, this was taken in South Carolina, uh, a state in the south on the east coast of the United States, and that state did not require helmets. That's what people look like when they have motorcycle accidents without a helmet. And in a discussion I had a long time ago with the chief medical examiner of Miami, Florida, uh, in their morgue, they have a museum. And along one wall, there are um, multiple motorcycle helmets. And he informed me that the motorcycle helmets don't save your life when you're in an accident. They just make you look better in the casket. Burn cases. Uh, forensic scientists call these cremains or cremated remains. Interestingly, the teeth are often preserved as may be the fingerprints, and I'll show you that a little later. Um, because of the insulating capacity of the air and the sinuses and the fat material in the buccal fat pad, the tongue may enlarge. So uh, we may be able to recover enough information to radiograph this uh, to effect an, an identification of someone burned this badly. It's important to determine whether someone was alive when they were being burned. So you'll find soot in the lungs, this cherry red color related to carbon monoxide poisoning. Or were they dead and then the scene set on fire to make it look like a suicide or accident. So the characteristics of being burned alive are the cherry red color and of the of these uh, mucosa and the uh, air that's taken in with soot in the lungs. Other cases indicating burns, and you can see that to some extent the teeth are even uh, saved. When the teeth are badly burned, they, it becomes very difficult to try and um, analyze them unless you're very careful because it, teeth uh, turn into ash in severe, bur uh, severe fires. And consider smoking a cigarette, leaving it in the ashtray and not smoking it. And it turns into the shape of the cigarette and it's an ash. If you go to touch it, it disintegrates. And a similar thing may happen with teeth. The picture on the left is uh, insect uh, scavenging. These are uh, fly maggots on a decomposing individual. And you can see that there is a removable prosthesis on the mandible. And when it was dissected, there was a denture on the maxilla as well, which have been used for identification. In the series of slides that you see, these rulers with the FA marking uh, also have a year and then the case number. FA stands for forensic autopsy. Essentially, there are two types of autopsies, medical autopsies and forensic autopsies. In a forensic autopsy, it's the state, the public, that needs to know why someone has died. Uh, medical autopsy confirms that someone has died from some existing disease like a stroke or cardiovascular disease, cancer, etc. The body on the right is again decomposed. Uh, this was a drowning. And we decompose from the inside out. The bacteria in our gut uh, and start to digest us. Gases build up. The other way we decompose is that every orifice of the body um, is 
uh, colonized by uh, flies and the maggots, as you see on the left, uh, help to decompose the body. Skeletonized remains are actually very um, easy to work with and you can gain lots of information from the skeleton. Um, the race, age, sex of an individual can be determined particularly by the pelvis and the skull. So we work very closely with an physical anthropologists and forensic anthropologists uh, because both of the tissues that we work with, the teeth and osseous tissue, uh, remain for long periods of time and are not easily uh, destroyed after death. I'm going to compare dental uh, identification with uh, the other forms of identification. And I'm going to give you the advantages and disadvantages of each variety of the way humans are identified, uh, beginning with the first, which is a non-scientific method, personal recognition and personal effects. The problem with this approach is that you're asking someone who has known the individual to go into the morgue, perhaps attempt to look at the bodies that I've just shown you, and emotion, the loss of the family member, they're very distraught, uh, this can lead to multiple errors. It's not unusual for uh, particularly females to exchange bits of clothing or bits, bits of uh, jewelry, and there have been numerous cases where individuals were misidentified following a, an accident because one family was sent to the morgue because they were told that their daughter was wearing a certain a bit of clothing, but it was actually clothing that was exchanged and their daughter was alive, albeit in intensive care. So this is not a, uh, a scientific way to identify individuals. But there are many things that could help to visually identify someone, including tattoos, scars, something that I don't understand in today's society, branding, and piercing. So even though these are uh, very specific, there may be other people in the world with the exact same tattoo. So again, this is not unique. And when we use the word unique in forensic science, that means that is the only person who can have that, uh, that arrangement of either fingerprints, dental, uh, and other morphometric types of measurements. I don't think this young gentleman would be applying to either our dental school or the uh, King Khalid Dental School in Saudi Arabia. We have lots of strange things going on in the world today. <laughs> and this is the gentleman who put the insanity uh, tattoo into uh, the lower lip of the young lady that you saw before. But these are all ways you could identify individuals if you had no other means. What about the morphometric? Morpho meaning physical or uh, you know, anatomical and metric. You can measure them. So you can obviously measure fingerprints. Finger, it's known that fingerprints are unique among individuals since the uh, beginning of the 20th century. And fingerprints were first used by the police department in New York City uh, after lots of research. The advantages. Fingerprints don't change through life. They remain, the fingerprint you're born with is the fingerprint you should die with. They are genetically determined and even identical twins have different fingerprints. The coding system internationally, whether it's Interfos, uh, the FBI, uh, the 
Canadian Mounted Police or any other police department around the world all describe fingerprints using the same coding system. So it's a universal coding system. In the United States, fingerprints are not only kept on individuals who might have challenged the law, but we have fingerprints now in a central database. Uh, many uh, civil types of things in the United States require uh, a fingerprint. Um, many banks now will accept a fingerprint as a means of identification. Here at the dental school, we experimented for a while with the faculty logging into our computer system with uh, their thumbprint. So uh, this is now a very accepted way to identify individuals. But here is the disadvantage. Fingerprints, as with the other soft tissues that you saw in the previous slides, uh, decompose relatively quickly uh, and you are going to lose the uh, ridge pattern that is the fingerprint. This is insect artifact uh, following the death of an individual and he had remained in the uh, woods in the forest for several days and ants attacked the hands that were exposed. Other things that are kind of experimental today, and we have hopes that we might be able to use these in the future. Uh, there has been research on palatal rugae and lip uh, uh, imprints, the ridges of our lips. PM, post-mortem, AM, anti-mortem. So here's a cast that was made in the dental office and I have outlined the rugae, and you can see the individual on the left, post-mortem, and again, there has been research uh, both from the forensic dental community and the anthropology community that these uh, are probably unique in their pattern. So one of the things that uh, I suggest is that any patient, even an edentulist patient, should have a life-size picture of their oral cavity, including the palate, uh, obtained with a ruler so that the picture could be brought back to one-to-one -to -one or life-size to compare with a decedent's uh, maxillary arch. Anthropology, obviously, the pelvis is important to determine whether uh, someone is male or female or not, and age, height. The concept of race in the anthropology community, we are all the same. There are no races. But I will use the term in the generic sense that uh, you are, have probably experienced. This is the pelvis of a female. For obvious reasons, it has an obtuse angle, and this female has had several births because the cartilage uh, pubic symphysis uh, shows some scarring and some ridging. So this, this pelvis has experienced probably several births. Male pelvises uh, are, have more of an acute angle. So that's one way to differentiate sex. As far as the skull is concerned in our area, uh, the female brow ridge is flat. Male brow ridge is, the glabellar ridge is more pronounced. The, the muscle attachments for all bones and particularly in the nuchal area of the skull, the more delicate uh, muscle attachments in the female. The mastoid bone in females is about the size of the fifth finger, the pinky. And in males, the mastoid bone is about the size of the thumb. The mastoid sinus, being bigger in males, 
adds to the resonance and deeper tone to the male voice. And there are other characteristics, uh, more of a square orbit and flared opening and nasal shelf in the Negroid or African descendant uh, skull. And from the side, again, you can tell that this is Caucasoid because of the plateau at the, uh, in the cranial vault of uh, Asian skulls tend to be more round and uh, skulls of individuals from uh, African descent tend to peak uh, at the posterior area. Caucasoid tend to have a European uh, view, which is uh, a teardrop shape to the orbit and a very tapered nose. One of the things we do today with uh, computer overlays uh, can be fa uh, photographic facial superimposition. Taking the skull, if you don't have dental records that are anti-mortem, uh, you might be able to find a picture with a smiling face and compare the skull and superimpose it over the photograph. The other way to use skeletonized remains is to reconstruct the face. The anthropologists have developed numerous atlases that determine the thickness of the soft tissues based on different racial and uh, uh, sex uh, characteristics for people from every uh, culture of the world. And these Clay areas will mark this depending on what is determined to be the uh, race of the individual and the sex. Then they fill it in with this type of uh, clay. This can now be done on computers as well. And this was a case that we had uh, and recreated the face this way. Uh, this was a Native American. We knew that from hair that was associated with the body. The glasses were found near the remains. And there are some characteristics that we use in dentistry that the anthropologists use as well. The mouth is as wide as the interpupillary distance. The nose is generally as long as the ears. We know from an artistic standpoint that the face is divided into thirds, one third, second third, and the forehead being the other third. So there are other uh, general characteristics of the human skull and face that can be used to try to develop some generic look for the individual to see if there's anyone who might recognize them. We now know that the frontal sinus is also unique in its outline. And if the uh, individual was known to have any uh, AP or anterior posterior skull films taken during life, uh, they might be compared to an AP skull film uh, of the decedent. And you can see in both of these cases, the outline is exactly the same. Uh, this chart indicates uh, many of the characteristics I've tried to describe, uh, differentiating between the classic, and I'll use the term racial groups, uh, Asian, African, and people of European descent. Now, of course, we have DNA as well, but that doesn't mean that forensic odontology is going to disappear. We use uh, genetics, uh, notice teeth and saliva are uh, ways that we can gather DNA that has not been contaminated. And of course, there are numerous laboratory techniques 
including the fact that if the uh, nuclear DNA is uh, contaminated to a point where it can't be used, mitochondrial DNA, which is only derived from the mother's side of the family, uh, might be used as well. And you can see that teeth, particularly the pulp, uh, is a principal way to acquire clean DNA for analysis. Unfortunately, when you do get use a tooth for harvesting DNA, the tooth has to be sacrificed. So obviously you're not gonna use a central incisor. Third molars are the most common tooth involved. This was a, a technique that was uh, developed uh, by Dr. Uh, Sweet in Canada, and he has done a tremendous amount of work uh, dis uh, discussing how to uh, acquire DNA from the teeth. So let's get into some of the individual identification. I'll let you read that. I hope we're not finishing restorations with our own fingerprints. So why is dental identification so effective? Well, there are an infinite number of comparison points, the same as there are in fingerprints. And if you look at the just the adult dentition, the combination of disease missing and filled teeth uh, is unique among individuals. No two individuals have the same combination. And I guess you can't give a lecture from Las Vegas without having a gambling analogy. Uh, clinically, we obviously have five surfaces to the teeth, and the combination of disease missing and restored surfaces is also very important. If you just take one tooth and look at all of those variables, disease missing and filled, you get this number and you multiply that by 32, you can see why uh, the teeth are a very good way to identify an individual. And then if you add the radiographic comparisons, as you'll see in a few minutes, uh, the anatomical trabecular patterns, the internal architectures of the pulp chambers and uh, pulp horns, you have numerous ways to identify and compare anti-mortem and post-mortem information. And the teeth remain intact for a long period of time, as I stated, uh, harder than bone. Remember, bone is 50% organic and 50% calcified. The teeth, the dentin at least, is 70% calcified. and the enamel 90%. So teeth can withstand tremendously high temperatures. And as I stated before, they are often protected by the soft tissues which may expand, the air which acts as a, um, an insulator in the sinuses. Here are two other cases, burned and fragmented. And look in this burn case how the teeth have been uh, retained. The circles are outlining fragments of maxilla and mandible that were uh, fractured but remained in the damaged skull so that uh, identification was uh, available through dental means. And another advantage, even identical twins have different tooth arrangements, either through disease and missing and variations in restorations. Uh, no twins have exactly the same arrangement of teeth. In this case, the bodies of two young women were commingled and they were missing for a year. Uh, they were finally discovered by a gentleman walking his dog, and the dog 
unearthed the dunes at the beach, and these young ladies were uh, recovered. Uh, luckily, most people have dental records. And what you're looking at here is actual courtroom material. Uh, this was the first case that I testified in in court. I was still a resident in 1974. Um, and you can see the postmortem that I charted in the morgue with dental uh, hieroglyphics. And the antemortem chart did not exist as a single chart. It was recovered from the records of uh, the orthodontist and oral surgeon and the general dentist of this particular uh, victim in this case. But the comparison can be done very quickly and inexpensively. And let's discuss this particular case. This is a different uh, case. If this were fingerprint evidence, they could not be the same individual no matter how many other points compared. And the reason they couldn't be the same is because of that. But obviously in dentistry with the fluid aspects of what happens with the teeth, um, I had a dental record, the written record, and from the time this antemortem radiograph was obtained to the time I took this radiograph in the morgue, the record indicated that this restoration had been placed. Something else that's variable in here, in the anterior root canal, it looks like there's only one uh, filling here. And if you have a good eye, you possibly can see two fillings, two roots on the upper. Now, that's simply a photographic error uh, from positioning. So obviously all three canals were filled but you couldn't see it in the uh, posterior from the angle that it was taken at. That could easily be explained to a jury, and uh, these are the same individual. Other things that uh, we've used over the years, this is a skeletonized mandible and maxilla that was found close to where this individual was supposed to live when the police recovered the denture in the nightstand beside his bed in the bedroom, the denture was placed on the skeletonized remains in the morgue. And you can see that this fits this jaw and this jaw only. It'd be nice if there had been a, an ID uh, listed in the, in the removable prosthesis, but this was highly uh, significant to making an identification. Crowns only fit the teeth they're prepped for. And we now have, particularly among the drug population, we have these, we call them grills. They look like the front bumpers on uh, cars from the 1950s. This is a slam dunk for those of us in uh, Las Vegas. You see something like this, easy to identify. The denture over here, we now in about 40 of the 48 or 50 states in the United States require that some identifying code or number be placed in a denture in a non-aesthetic area so that it could be recovered if lost or be used for forensic identification. And this is a denture that the gentleman was wearing when he committed suicide by putting a gun in his mouth, holding the gun against the denture. These are powder burns from the bullet wound and of course the fracturing of the denture. Another burn case where the prosthesis was not with the person when they were burned. And you can see again that this fits the a disarticulated burned maxill. So here are anterior, um, anterior, <laughs> antemortem and postmortem radiographs. And here 
is another situation where you don't even have any restorations. And in the postmortem situation, the teeth have been fractured off based on whatever trauma there was that caused the death. No restorations, but we really don't need any. Look at this trabecular pattern. This, these three up here, one, two, three, one, two, three. And if you look at the mesial pulp horn, uh, those are identical. And these radiographs could physically be superimposed um, either with a computer or by hand to show that they are exactly the same and have to come from the same individual. There are many other uh, anatomical features which you might have already seen in these two radiographs. So what are the challenges when making an ID through dental evidence? Well, we start with baby teeth, 20 deciduous teeth, finally get our 32 adult teeth, and finally may wind up with no teeth at all. So we have fluidity where fingerprints remain the same. Unfortunately, there are a variety of coding systems throughout the world. In the United States, we use the universal system, starting in the upper right quadrant. Tooth number one is the third molar. 16 is the other third molar on the, other, on the left side. And then around to 17 and 32. The Palmer notation uses a box. And FDI, Federation Dentaire Internationale, the two-digit system, the first digit representing the quadrants, maxillary right is one, is one and uh, maxillary left is two, etc. Now, this presents a problem if you don't know who's doing the charting or where the chart came from. In the United States, tooth number 12 would be the maxillary first bicuspid. In the Federation Dentaire International System, tooth number one, two, that's the way the notation is, would be the maxillary right lateral incisor. So 12 and one, two, you have to know who's doing the charting. In the United States, at least, we do not have a centralized uh, uh, practice of dentistry uh, as many socialist countries do. Um, so many records are in private offices. They may be in clinics or hospitals, dental schools, or even in prisons or military records. It's difficult to find where the dental records are. And we are human beings, we're all entitled to make mistakes, and dentists are no different than anybody else. So some anti-mortem records vary in their completeness, and many of us make inconsistent abbreviations and nomenclatures. And this presents a tremendous problem for the forensic dentist trying to compare anti-mortem records with what we find in the morgue. I'll give you an example here. Here's tooth number 31. If tooth number 31 moves here into the 30 position, it doesn't change its name. It's still tooth number 31. Aging by teeth and bones is a very uh, uh, important topic today. It has received a lot of research and um, my Colleagues in Saudi Arabia can be proud of the research that was done by one of uh, your uh, faculty at uh, Riyadh. Uh, so here is obviously a young individual less than six years of age. Uh, we use the wrist bones and their calcifications uh, also to age an individual. This is someone who is six. This is an adult who, through other means as well, was determined to be in their 50s. 
And today we uh, use the London Atlas, the Atlas of Tooth Development and Eruption. And the individual who created this atlas was Dr. al Katani from Riyadh. We are doing some research here with our orthodontic residents using cone beam analysis and this atlas to determine the age of a Hispanic population in the Las Vegas community. So the way we compare, we look at the post-mortem information, as I stated, matching composite anti-mortem, that's AM does not stand for morning, and PM is post-mortem, not evening. Lots of computer data is important and one of the major uh, computer programs that was developed by a board certified forensic dentist, Dr. James McGivney, is WinID3 and you can download that for free. He has graciously put this on the internet to use for anyone who is uh, using a dental comparison. Another program that is used, was used uh, in New York on 9-11 uh, was developed by Kenneth Ashheim, and this is part of a uh, unified identification system that the federal government in the United States, and particularly the uh, coroner's office, medical examiner's office in New York uses this. Udom, is the dental component of the unified victim identification system. And these are some of the problems that you see. The missing teeth after death. Uh, we often have adult radiographs after death, and the only records we have are records from childhood. So lots of complications uh, with these types of attempts to identify individuals. But we can superimpose images, antemortem and postmortem, and we don't even need the teeth. Here's a, a radiograph antemortem, and I've overlaid it over the postmortem. You can see these points that are identical with the points on the uh, post-mortem radiograph. So again, probably not a slam dunk positive identification, but highly consistent with uh, the comparison of the antemortem and post-mortem radiographs. Putting all of this material, antemortem composite dental information in with the postmortem into a computer program. And this is very helpful, particularly in multiple fatality incidents. So you definitely want to compare and apples to apples. And in this particular case, the antemortem was a panoramic radiograph. Postmortem, we took individual images, and you can see the comparison with things that match exactly. So this was a positive identification. I've had to redact out all the names, but uh, this is the kind of chart that would be submitted to the uh, legal uh, authorities indicating that uh, a positive identification has been achieved. And our specialty board has determined specific language that should be used when testifying, uh, whether it's a positive identification, a possible identification. There are cases that have insufficient evidence, and in some cases, no match at all, there's exclusion. Obviously, what happens with the individual identification is not just a factor of how many bodies you have. 
for instance, it's not 10 times harder to identify 10 individuals in an airplane accident than it would be one. It could be hundreds of times more difficult because of dismemberment, body parts, the uh, status of the post-mortem information. So we become very involved as forensic dentists in multiple fatality incidents, MFIs. Uh, this is a schematic of a temporary morgue, and you can see that the dental component is one of many as the body is placed on a gurney and moved from station to station to uh, achieve cause of death, manner of death, and then identification. And this is what these facilities look like. Every body is examined at least three times. Um, this gentleman is doing the charting or, or looking in the mouth. And then all of these individuals will switch roles because you don't want to make any mistakes in these stressful situations. Uh, we now have portable radiographic equipment which can be taken into the field as well. Notice the individuals here are all wearing hazmat uh, uniforms. And this is the uh, information gathering area. Notice all the computers. Uh, very often hygienists become very important in uh, bringing in and, and assessing uh, the antimortem material and entering that material into the computer. Again, portable radiographic equipment that's uh, very useful today. Uh, this uh, was used in the tsunami incident and uh, in other multiple fatality incident situations around the world. Obviously, along with that goes the computer sensors, and this is very convenient because you no longer have to have wet uh, film and uh, uh, you know the all of the materials needed to process film. So when we talk about a multiple fatality incident, essentially an incident is something that is an unplanned and undesired event. <clears throat> that doesn't mean that you can't prevent it or prepare for it and. Unfortunately, this is the burial, mass burial of individuals who uh, drowned and were recovered from the tsunami in 2004 in the Indian Ocean. They were not identified. Again, a situation, the Haiti earthquake in 2010, this is the morgue door for uh, the state-run morgue for the entire Haiti, the nation of Haiti, and they were just actually piling bodies in front of it uh, in a equatorial temp, uh, climate, uh, not the best to preserve the bodies. One of the challenges you have in many uh, multiple fatality incidents, particularly hurricanes and other natural disasters, is that the infrastructure of the community is destroyed. So a dental office and its records may be destroyed as well. There's lack of refrigeration and there's uh, lack of an ability to store the mass of bodies as you saw in Haiti. I like to define multiple fatality incidents in several different subcategories. There are natural disasters, unintentional and intentional man-made disasters. Among the natural, you find these. This is a schematic of the power that the tsunami had off the Indian Ocean. It actually traveled all the way to the east coast of Africa. I like it when patients come in and say, uh, I'm taking this herb, doctor, because it's natural and it has to be good. And my response to them is, well, other natural things like wildfires, tornadoes, mudslides, and hurricanes uh, are natural, but they're not so good. <laughs> um, 
unintentional man-made disasters, industrial accidents, military accidents, transportation accidents, plane accidents, etc. And of course, uh, if you go back to the radiation accident at Chernobyl, so we all can make mistakes. Some of the victims, uh, when bo human bodies burn, they tend to uh, constrict the muscles. Your flexor muscles are more powerful than your extensor muscles in your arm, and they pull up into what is known as a boxer's pose. And here's an example where even in someone severely burned like this, the fingerprints may be saved as a hand goes into a fist. This gentleman, unfortunately, died while making illegal firecrackers, and the building he was in ex uh, exploded, and he was uh, killed, obviously, in, in many different parts. Uh, this head was found about uh, a third of a mile from uh, the incident site in a tree. It was identified by his teeth. Look how the teeth have been pre preserved in this severely uh, burned cremains, uh, easily identified by the teeth. And this is the superimposition case I showed you from the a burn case. Remember the facial restoration. And finally, uh, the victims. This was, this, this hotel in Las Vegas is now Bally's. It was the old MGM Grand and they had a fire there back in 1980. And the forensic dentist in the community help to identify those individuals. Uh, this is a pattern found after death called liver. Most people pronounce it liver, but it's liver mortis. And when you die, your blood vessels leak out your blood, and obviously the blood stains a permanent stain on the most dependent part of the body. So if you were to find this body lying in this position, after death, you know that the body had been, removed, been moved after death because this should be, the, the person should have been lying on their back. We talk a lot about the people who commit serial homicide, etc. Uh, I like to honor the victims. Most people never know who the victims are. And I will challenge you who was the perpetrator of the crimes that killed all these young women who looked more or less alike, all uh, brunette people of European heritage. I'll give you a second, and there's our criminal, Ted Bundy. Uh, this was the first time bite mark evidence was introduced in the state of Florida. Look at his unique dentition. His cuspids are below his lower centrals. He has these uh, fractures uh, to the maxillary arch. He obviously has some type of anterior overbite with the wear on his lower centrals. And this is what I call the famous double bite by Ted Bundy. This is an overlay of his uh, hollow overlay of the outline of his anterior teeth and the bite mark. Uh, he was executed uh, probably 10, 15 years ago by the state of Florida for uh, the homicides he perpetrated. Are there any questions? Yeah, Prof, uh, uh, before I thank you, if you see the Q&A icon at the top, you can see that there are, I think, five or six questions which you can okay. answer. I think there's one slide left. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Where do I want to go? You can do it for me. I can't it's see. at the top, the Q&A icon. You can oh, see six okay. questions okay. there. <laughs> I'm fine. <laughs> 
to the first question. Uh, the first question was, how are you? So I'm, I'm well, thank you, inshallah. Uh, is the size of the mastoid the same among all age groups? Uh, well, like all uh, structures of the skull, it's going to increase in size. But when you're talking about the adult, in general, the mastoid is larger in males, again, the size of your thumb, as opposed to females, the size of your fifth finger. Uh, what is your opinion about the role of the palatal ruga in prediction of sex and ethnicity? Uh, I don't have an opinion of that because I don't think you can uh, do that. Uh, tell you what race or uh, sex the individual is. But it can, the pattern itself, a fingerprint can't tell you the difference uh, among ethnicity groups and sex uh, groups. But uh, it can be used as a pattern for identification. That was from Saeed. Uh, Kaleem Sultan Mohammed, uh, pulp tissue from a charred body, can it be used? Yes. Can it be used for DNA analysis? Uh, Again, that's variable. It depends really how seriously the body has been burned. Uh, but again, with, uh, with the, um, uh, the um, I just lost my train of thought for a second. With the uh, heat and the insulation from the various uh, sinuses and and fat tissue and all, you may be able to preserve some DNA. Probably again from an impacted third molar is the best source. Pulp tissue from a decayed uh, tooth. Uh, the decay, if it's involving the pulp, may alter the pulp uh, with bacterial products, toxins, uh, endotoxins or exotoxins, etc. So ideally, you want a virgin tooth to be used for DNA gathering and harvesting. Are there any other questions? Yeah, uh, eight oh, questions. Ooh. <laughs> Nine now. <laughs> okay. You can which go quickly through them. Yeah, there's no action. Which of the following is more significant than burns? Is it the human teeth or the long bones, which will also help more identification? The long bones, interestingly, can tell you racial differences. Uh, there are, and I'm not an anthropologist and I don't play one on TV, but uh, when you get involved in this discipline, you learn something about ballistics and anthropology and toxicology. So the long bones are helpful in, in sorting out uh, ethnic backgrounds. Uh, Asians and uh, people of African descent and Caucasians, particularly in the femur and the, the long bones, you may be able to tell which race they are. Um, but the, the teeth are especially helpful. For instance, anterior teeth in Native Americans and people from Asia, the incisors have what we call shovel-shaped incisors. That's not found in people of African or, or European descent. Europeans have a cusp of carabelli on the molar, and they have what I like to describe as a hot cross bun uh, appearance to the grooves in the molars. People of African descent have multiple grooves on the surface of their molars. So the, the teeth uh, can help in sex and in uh, uh, ethnic background. Uh, uh, Mohammed Asif Sheikh, are there any studies conducted on lip prints in Western populations? Uh, not that I know of at this point. And uh, all of these studies on different um, uh, populations, Hispanic, uh, Turkish, you, you name it, any subgroup, uh, would add to the body of knowledge, I think, significantly. Uh, have you ever encountered or employed any person identification using lip prints? Personally, I have not. 
in my experience and reviewing the literature, this is still something that uh, is in the research phase. I don't know of any case that's been that type of And uh, Saeed Yassin, uh, any age estimation method in children more reliable than, oh yes, uh, reliable than uh, Demergian. Demergian's uh, study was probably the seminal study years ago, but certainly the London Atlas uh, from your colleague in Saudi Arabia uh, is what I would use today for many of the age uh, groups, the children, teenagers, and adults. Oh, we're getting more. Just to... Uh... Thanks, Professor Edward, for your presentation. I enjoyed it. I'm happy to look to your research on that area as I'm an orthodontist. I guess we may have common area in between. Well, thank you for the attaboy, as we call it here in the States. Uh, Mohammed Asif Sheikh again. How can you identify bite marks in the tissue if the tissue is charred or teared? Um, I suggest you attend the next lecture if I'm invited to present the bite mark lecture. But uh, obviously burned tissue, uh, human, human tissue is not a good impression material. Now there are bite patterns in inanimate objects like cheese and, and other foods and even uh, inanimate um, things like cardboard. But uh, charred and torn human tissue will lead to a distortion. And then the very anatomy itself, uh, people get bitten in areas that are easily distorted, the breast, the buttocks, the shoulder, etc. I think that's all the questions. Yeah, that's all. Thank you so much. It was truly a very fascinating lecture, you know, and we had uh, many young dentists here, and I'm sure many of them will have forensic odontology as their future uh, speciality. Well, uh, it's very interesting, and I hope to encourage them to, if they do get involved in this discipline, to attend the American Academy of Forensic Sciences meetings, which are always held in February. And if they need more information about that, they can contact me here at the school or uh, Dr. Al Tahani at, in, um, uh, in Riyadh. Uh, he attends the meetings on a regular basis. There are other organizations that they can join too, and uh, if they want to email me, I'll give them that information. Thank you so much. And that was Dean Ibrahim thank you, thanking you. You know, the message Ibrahim was from Dean Ibrahim. And uh, okay. uh, truly fascinating. And we are so thankful to you for this. Uh, very, very interesting lecture. And we, on 21st March, we'll have an equally interesting lecture by Dr. Uh, Tanya Al Talib on uh, sleep yes. apnea. She's there with you. Yes, and, and she's not, and she's not sleeping. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have you day after tomorrow, same time. Yes. And, and if sure you would like, as you set these up in the future, I will be more than happy to talk about uh, forensics and abuse and forensics and bite pattern uh, analysis. Oh, that would be so good. You know, we can have a continuous, uh, you know, a series of webinars and we're always open to that. Uh, Great. Thank you so much. Uh, and we look forward to your next lecture also. We have two lectures with you. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, the other so one that on di diagnosing of... Uh, of oral lesions. lesions. Right. Yes. And uh, I don't want to keep you, you all up late at night, so you all have a good night. Thank you again, and I thank the e-learning deanship. We have Riyadh, Ahmed. Without their help, this could not have been possible. Thank you, Dean uh, Shehrani. You know, you put in a lot of effort to make this possible. And uh, Tanya, we'll see you on Wednesday, inshallah, uh, yeah. for another lecture. Yeah. Thank you, Prof. Edward. Thanks a lot. You're so welcome. that is the that's okay. the end of this, the first webinar. I am so happy it has been a very successful. Thank you. Well, I'm glad Thank I was able to start it off, and you felt it was good. Uh, uh, that was a uh, that was a fantastic start. Uh, start, you know, no errors, no mistakes, nothing. It went smoothly. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Technology is the important yes. thing. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Have a nice day. You too. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.